Well, brothers and sisters, as we mentioned during the congregational prayer, uh, this week, this past week, was Ascension Day, and we celebrate Ascension Day on this Sunday. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, why does it matter? Why does Ascension Day matter? And part of the question is really uh, sort of implied, uh, wouldn't it have been better for us for Jesus to stay here? I, I, I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if Jesus, the risen Lord, stayed here on earth and, and continued to spread the gospel and to teach us and to heal and to rule and to uh, take care of his disciples and us and so on? Wouldn't that be fantastic? It's a good question. So why does Ascension Day matter? Well, we know a bit about why Ascension Day matters from what Jesus says, right? He says that he is going to heaven to prepare a place for us. He tells us that there are many mansions in his Father's house. There are many rooms in his Father's house, and that he is preparing a place for us, which is great. That is fantastic news. He also tells us that it is part of the fulfillment of what he was called to do, that he is to ascend to the right hand of the Father, and that he is interceding for us right now in heaven. We also understand that he is coming back. So those are all good things. But let's first look at the scriptures to see what it is that God says through the scriptures to us about the ascension. So this is from, we're going to read from Luke chapter 24, the end of the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to read from the beginning of Acts. And as you probably know, Luke and Acts were written as the, uh, by the same author, the Dr. Luke, uh, who was uh, probably a Greek, a, perhaps a Jewish person of Greek, um, of Greek uh, citizenship, uh, educated in Greece, uh, or perhaps a Gentile himself. Uh, we're not entirely sure about that, but regardless, Luke and Acts kind of form part one and part two of what he uh, writes about the story, the, the reality of Jesus' existence here on earth and all that that has meant. And so we're going to hear uh, the end of Luke's, Luke and the beginning of Acts as Luke pulls up, uh, sort of, or takes up his tale again and tells uh, his uh, patron, the person he's writing to, uh, Theophilus, about uh, what continues on after Jesus' ascension. So Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. He said to them, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And that, of course, is alluding to to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that came on Pentecost and which lives even now in each of us. Continuing on, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he held, lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Now we move on 
to Acts, which remember is written by the same guy, but you'll hear a slightly different account of how things uh, happened. And, and does that mean that, of course, that these two things disagree, that, that Luke is somehow inconsistent? No. It simply means that Luke is giving uh, greater detail. Uh, uh, he is giving, filling in some of the blanks of what happened. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of my favorite theologians, Karl Barth, says about this passage that the most important verse in this whole passage is the one which runs, A cloud received him out of their sight. Why would he say that? One of the foremost theologians of the 20th century, why would he say that the most important verse is the one where a cloud hides Jesus from the disciples' eyes? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand uh, about clouds in the scripture. And understanding about clouds in the scripture will not only help us understand why this verse in particular is so important, but it will also help us to understand why Ascension Day is so important. So let's look back. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 9, verses 16 to 17. In this passage, God says to Noah and to his family, Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. See, we, we always think about the rainbow in there, but we need to notice also the clouds. The clouds, there's something significant there. God is revealing and remembering his covenant with Noah and with all life on this earth. Out of the clouds, through the rainbow. Or let's move forward just a little bit more, and perhaps you remember this cloud. Exodus chapter 13, verses 20 to 22. This is just after Israel has gotten out of Egypt, or they're getting out of Egypt, and they're in the process of doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and this is what we read. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Once again, we see that there is, there is this, this reality of God's sort of hiddenness in the clouds, but also revelation in the clouds. The, the people are given guidance through a cloud. When we think about clouds, we, we talk about how they obscure vision, not how they clear things up, right? If you're feeling cloudy in the head, that means you don't really know, you're not really registering, your brain's not firing on all cylinders, perhaps. You're, you're not seeing things properly. We certainly have to watch out on the roads for fog, which is clouds, of course, on, on the earth, right? We have to watch out. We have to be careful because we can't see because of the clouds. But that's not always the way it is in Scripture. Clouds, even as they hide something, also reveal something. What about this cloud from Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 19? On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, <coughs> excuse me, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. You see here that that God is revealing himself even as his essence is hidden from the people of Israel. And this, this symbol, this, this, this way that God employs of both revealing and hiding, of, of showing us something about himself, showing us that he is, in some senses, beyond comprehension, but also that he reveals himself to us. This continues on throughout the whole of Scripture. In the prophets, <coughs> we read the various prophets seeing God's glory like a cloud, or, or his, uh, his, his presence like a cloud, and being awed by that. And then, too, in the Gospels, Jesus himself speaks about the glory of God and about himself returning in the clouds. And so, too, in the revelation, the, the revelation that the Apostle John receives, God and the clouds are connected. See, brothers and sisters, clouds in the biblical story, they symbolize the hiddenness of God. Now, that could be a discouraging thought, because this means that somehow God is hidden from us. That we cannot see God. But that's not all. Clouds symbolize the hiddenness of God and, and they always set the stage for revelation. 
they always set the stage for revelation. This is, revelation is not just some word that, that's attached to a book title. <clears throat> it is the revealing of God, the revealing of God and his purposes in this world, his plan for this world, his plan for us. Clouds always symbolize both the hiddenness of God and they always set the stage for revelation, the revealing of God. That's how it is, brothers and sisters, with the ascension. Jesus, as we know, is the ultimate revelation of God. We can see this in the Mountain of Transfiguration, where they are surrounded by clouds. <coughs> Excuse me. They are surrounded by clouds, and in the cloud, God is revealed through Jesus Christ. His glory shines through, and the disciples who are with Jesus at the time see Jesus as he really is. And so even in the cloud... Jesus is revealed, and so God is revealed to those disciples. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. He is hidden in the clouds from the disciples with the promise that he will return with the final revelation of God. When all people will see God face to face. And we will live with God forever. Listen to what Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 14 near the end of his life. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus connects himself with God who is I am. Right? The revealed name of God given to Moses so many years ago. Jesus says, I am. And then he connects himself with God as coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus going away not only fulfills the prophecies about him and what he was going to do and how things were going to work, not only is he preparing a place for us, but also through the cloud we can see that God is connected with Jesus. They are one and the same, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but so too we can see that Jesus, who bears, who is the ultimate revelation of God, is setting the stage for the final revelation when he will come again to us. So that in Christ, in Christ, the clouds become the way by which we see. In Christ, all may see. Brothers and sisters, Ascension Day matters. It matters to us. Not only because of God preparing a place for us in Jesus Christ, not only because Jesus is even now interceding for us at the right hand of the Father in heaven, not only because of the revelation that we see in John's book of Revelations, but also, brothers and sisters, because in Christ we see that the clouds of God will finally be pulled away so that we see God face to face. This is good news. 
This is good news for us to share in this world. How exciting that God who has revealed himself even as he has remained hidden, that God one day, one day, we will know him face to face, just as Adam and Eve did before the fall, just as we were always meant to do. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Jesus Christ, the ascended Lord, will return on the clouds of heaven and all will see and all will know. Ascension Day matters. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so very much for sending your Son to us. Thank you so much for working throughout all of human history to reveal yourself to us. Lord, we acknowledge that there is so much about you that we are not capable of understanding, that we could not in our sins see you face to face, that you were hidden from us, and that even today, though we have seen you in Jesus Christ, even today, the full understanding of who you are has is yet to come. Lord, we long for the day when Jesus will return on the clouds of heaven and we will see face to face. And then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. Lord, come. Come again, we pray. And until that day, Lord, please reveal yourself to us through scriptures. Reveal yourself to us through the working, the ongoing working of your Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in however you choose to do so. But also, O oh God, use us to be your witnesses here and everywhere. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.